the, the reason for this is Firstly Much of the problems that we're facing They don't involve specific ayat and a hadith They don't involve issues that are discussed in books of fiqh These are new issues Issues that are unprecedented in the ummah You're not going to look up a book of fiqh and find this guidance And they all revolve around what we call in Arabic The masalih and the mafasid or if you like the pros and cons of a situation. The alim will give the fatwa based upon what outweighs what. Does the evil outweigh the good, in which case it's haram, or does the good outweigh the evil, in which, in, in, in which case it will be halal. The majority of issues that we face as a community, such as voting, participating in demonstrations, interacting with other peoples and other groups, interacting with specific politicians, these issues, you cannot look them up in a book of fiqh. You cannot look them up in a book of tafsir. No doubt there are great ulama whom we all love and respect who would know such issues of, as I term, book knowledge. Not in a derogatory sense. I mean knowledge that has been discussed. When I say book knowledge, I'm not trying to mean, a'udhu billah, it's, it's not relevant. I'm saying knowledge that has been discussed and codified. This type of knowledge, there are many scholars who are great, great ulama on the face of this earth. But there, there is another type of knowledge and that is the knowledge of the reality of the situation. And that knowledge cannot be studied in a book. It can only be experienced. Only those who are living in a land can understand the real pros and cons. And an incident comes to mind that helps clarify this point. Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah once passed by a Mongol soldier drinking alcohol and getting drunk. He was drunk on the street. The Mongols had outwardly embraced Islam and yet they were tyrannical. They were killing and raping and plundering and looting, but they are outwardly Muslim. Some of the students of Ibn Taymiyyah went to go and try to stop this soldier. Tell him to fear Allah and give up this, this alcohol. Ibn Taymiyyah said, no, don't go. Let him drink and let him remain drunk. Why, O Ibn Taymiyyah? Because he said, this soldier, if he becomes sober, he is going to rape and plunder and kill and steal and loot from Muslims. It's better that he remains drunk, lying on the street, and at least the other Muslims are protected from his harm. Now can you imagine if such a scenario had happened in our times, when an alim would have seen something like this and told the Muslims, let the Muslim drink. Immediately some overzealous, undereducated brothers would have called up their mashayikh and have said, Shaykh, 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 there's this guy here, he calls the student, their students call him Shaykh al-Islam. And, and he passed by a Muslim who was drinking. And he told his students to let him remain drunk. And not to give them advice. And he allowed this Muslim to drink alcohol. What do you think the shaykh is going to say as a response to this? This guy is a deviant, he's this, he's that. Remain, stay away from him. What do you think he's going to say? Presented the situation as he was presented with. Of course he's going to give the fatwa that he gives. But because Ibn Taymiyyah lived in Damascus. And he knows what the Mongol soldiers are. And he can see that which other people cannot see. He gives the fatwa that he gives. Now, I wish we had Ibn Taymiyyah living in our times. Even in the East, much less in the West. But just because we don't have Ibn Taymiyyah doesn't mean we don't have any knowledge. There are people amongst us, great students of knowledge and even scholars, who are qualified to give fatwas. Who have studied at the feet of the greatest ulama. But they also live amongst us. They have spent their lives in da'wah, 15, 20, 30 years in da'wah. And they understand our situation. All I am saying, we have to hear their voice. And give it precedence over the voices of those who don't understand the situation. Now of course there are issues that transcend borders. If I needed to look up a hadith, and I couldn't figure out if hadith is authentic or not, I call the greatest alim on the face of this earth. I don't care if he's in Timbuktu, or Morocco, or Medina, or Zimbabwe, I don't care. This is a hadith, it doesn't matter where you are, it's going to be authentic or not, based upon evidences that have nothing to do with where I'm living. But, participating in, 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 in votes, going out in demonstrations, doing this and that, many of the ulama abroad have never understood these situations and scenarios. They don't understand how secular democracies work. They don't live it. Just like we don't understand how their countries work. We don't understand their culture. When we go there, we're culturally totally inadequate. We don't know how to act in that culture. We do things that are foolish sometimes. We don't know. Similarly, they don't know our culture. And it is not disrespectful. It is not derogatory to point this out. Scholars are human beings, no matter how great they are. And they are a product of their culture and civilization. They are influenced where they live by. So brothers and sisters,
No doubt we do not have the caliber of ulama like we do back home. We don't have these major, major ulama living amongst us. But we do have people who have studied under them. We do have students of knowledge and even mashayikh and muftis who are living amongst us, who have reached 50, 60 years of age, who understand our situation better than anybody else does. Remember the hadith of the Prophet wasallam. The one who sees is not like the one who hears. This is a hadith. The one who sees is not like the one who hears. When these ulama see the situation, they can appreciate certain things that even if you try to describe them, you would not be able to do so. So, these are the five issues that I have discussed. I believe that if we wish to go forward, we have to understand these issues and answer them. They are not the only issues. There are many more issues besides these. And perhaps in future lectures, other issues can be raised. But these five are, first and foremost, can we live here? The answer is yes, as long as we practice Islam. Secondly, what is our long-term goal here? Our long-term goal is to ensure that we can practice Islam and pass it down to our children. Thirdly, our interaction with other members of society has to be proactive. Fourthly, our interaction with other Muslims has also have, have to solidify. And lastly, we need to respect indigenous scholarship. I'm not saying cut off ties from other scholars. I'm saying respect those who live here and appreciate their voice and realize that they understand our situation the likes of which no one else can. And remember, I have given my responses to these five questions, but I once again reiterate, what is important is not that you agree with me, not at all. Wallahi, if you disagree with every single response, that would still make me happy, as long as you go away thinking, thinking about these issues. And I admit, standing before you today, I admit, 5, 10, 15, 20 years down the line, I might modify, I might fine tune my own responses. I'm not saying they're right. I want you to disagree, but at least start thinking. What is your vision? Where do you see Islam 5, 10, 15 generations down the line? How do you think we'll be able to preserve Islam by being militant and rhetorical and arrogant and angry and condescending? Or by understanding we are a minority, a religious minority. There are people out there who no doubt would want to see us exterminated. But there are other people out there, non-Muslims, who would not mind us living in their ranks as long as we practice our Islam and preach it peacefully to other people. Keep these points in mind as you formulate your responses. Brothers and sisters in Islam, no doubt we are traversing a path that has not been traveled before. This is the first time we have so many millions of Muslims experiencing these secular democracies. So we have no map left to us by our scholars gone by. 